believe in you, Joe. I believe in you. <laughs> it says we're live in the top corner of my screen. I have no idea what we're doing. It says we're live. We're waiting for it to go. There we are. All right, guys. How are you doing today? This is Joe Smith with the New East Prohibition Talk Radio. We are finally live. We are back. Uh, another great week. Uh, we have Danica Dunseeth, right? Did I say it right? They say yes, it right. Sir. Did it right. Okay, you did, guys. You did. <laughs> uh, we are going to be talking to Can Collective. Uh, she's the founder. Um, she's doing great things in Canada. You've been awarded. You've been um, nominated for you know the 50 most aspiring women in, in Canada in the in the industry, right? In the cannabis industry. 40 under 40. Don't age yes. me. Don't age me. <laughs> so you, there's a lot of cool things we're going to talk about today. Um, I want to welcome back Timothy Fair of Vermont Cannabis Solutions, who joins us every week. We'll be talking about laws, cannabis laws, um, things throughout the show. Um, and also we have Thomas Markholm. Markholm. We're working on that too. Uh, Vermont Grow Coaching, who will be doing... You'll, you'll get it eventually. I'll get it eventually. <laughs> I just get I going, you. guys. You, you know, I have oh, my got amazing meeting. name. meeting. And we get going, right? And we get excited for guests, and like when I, you know, my wheels start spinning faster than my mouth, and it, sometimes it comes out wrong. Just be glad I don't mumble anymore. Um, <laughs> so, so we're here, guys. Uh, Danica is back for a second time. We had her on a little over a year ago. Um, now you you're in Canada, right? So this is going to be unique for a lot of people because there's a lot of differences up there right now, right? Um, and we were talking earlier um, a few weeks ago about the COVID things and how things are going. So before we get too far into those situations, tell everybody who you are, um, where you're from, and how you got into this cannabis industry. Um. Okay. Yeah. So super quickly, you're probably going to see my little monsters in the background. But um, my background is actually primarily public relations and communications. And I started at a startup CBD company. And I knew that I owned 100 acres that we were doing a cash crop with in Stratford, Ontario. So looking further into that, I got obsessed with hemp. And I knew exactly what the end goal was going to be with that. So I got further into it and we, I started planting. I was supposed to do one acre, I did 50. We yielded 93,000 kilograms. And I started getting further and further obsessed. But my, uh, as much as I love CBD, I'm really focused on the bioplastic and the biofuel aspect, so industrial hemp. And that's kind of, that's what our company is up to. So we're integrating a consulting company. So we, we really want to get media and communications, which is why we love talking to your program and all that good stuff, um, as well as doing, you know, kind of the processing. But we're seeing a huge lack of infrastructure in Canada right now. And I, I know a lot of my American friends are feeling the same. So, so biofuels, so this is a transition from the last time we were talking, correct? Yes, sir. It always is. I'm never done. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm really interested in this because I'm not going to lie to you. I was probably on the phone for about six hours yesterday um, talking about biofuels um, and, and what that industry looks like. Um, what made you kind of switch gears and look that direction right now? To be totally honest, it's my farm that inspires me because every time that I take a next step, I find something that was untapped. So I noticed that there's a diesel tank down there, which obviously was used to do all the farm equipment, you know, 30 years ago before it was untapped, yay. And I was like, well, why are we converting this into hemp biofuel when we are making our own crops? And this year, I believe in proof of concept. So everybody's saying, and especially in my area, why, how does it grow? What is it doing? And I was like, you're not understanding how resilient this plant is. So I didn't plant a new crop this year. I did a split crop with a farmer because to your point about COVID, people are really, really nervous and they're not willing to make that, that step into the unknown. So proof of concept, I said, don't touch these four acres, legitimately do nothing, till it into the ground. So this year I've created a new genetic that we actually have no idea what it is. So now I've sent it for soil sampling. And this is the thing, the plant just wants to grow and it does so, so well. And now the same farmers are like, well, what? And I was like, I'm telling you that this is the same seed that is being tilled in that is just regrowing. 
So we're kind of in a huge R&D point. And, you know, we're, my company is grateful that we're in the position to be able to do that and to be able to provide proof of concept. Mm -hmm. Which is amazing. Um, a lot of what we talk about in the show is, you know, those, these byproducts, these, these, these things that we have left over, fuels, um, fibers is another big conversation. Now, we know fiber in, you know, processing of fibers in America is really tough right now because there's very few manufacturing. What is the support in Canada right now? Is there manufacturing for biofuels? Is it something that's up and coming or is it something that's not really there yet? Like, where does Canada stand in the biofuel markets? The thought, the thought is definitely there and you have, you have the right people thinking about it, but like, and I've said it a million times, the infrastructure is not there. So mm -hmm. we have the right players in the game that say, hey, we want to do this, but we need the infrastructure and we definitely need the facility. And a huge thing is that what you guys are able to, um, your genetics in the mm -hmm. US, and again, I've said this a million times, what you're able to do in the U.S., we're not able to do in Canada. So when we're trying to do business with the U.S., and we're trying to, you know, create a higher CBD yield, or we're trying to create industrial hemp, we're not able to work together between the borders. And that's definitely a hindrance to all of these farms that want to convert to hemp. But you, and I'm a firm believer, I will not let my clients plant something that is not sold because you don't know what's going to happen and that's, that's risk management. So it's, and it, COVID has definitely taken a toll on that as well. Mm -hmm. Which is, which is unique. So what do you, so you, you have a crop going now, right? Um, you said there's no infrastructure right now that you guys don't have much going on in Canada. What, what do you, what are the plans for the crop at the end of the season? Like what's the process to make biofuel? Um, so Other guests know. There are, and, well, no, there, there's definitely a lot going on in Canada. The problem is, though, province to province, it's hard to work together, right? Because there's an amazing company, Manitoba Harvest. When I want to be able to sell my product to them, it's in Alberta. So that's like, it's like driving from England to Syria, to put it into perspective in terms of distance. In order to do that, you then we're talking about transportation, and there's not a lot of companies that are currently doing that. So all these variables come into place. For my crop specifically this year, I'm going to be um, getting a decorticator and doing my own hempcrete bricks and starting to build the first hempcrete house in Ontario, Canada. So I, got, I went a different way. Rather than doing large scale production, I wanted to really bring it back into the farm and make the farm a proof of concept, like I mentioned. No, it sounds amazing because uh, that's something we preach all the time is, you know, how can we make this sustainable? How can we bring this into construction? The hempcrete is an amazing idea. A lot of people don't realize it's fireproof. It has a lot of great properties that we just don't have with regular wood, you know what I mean? Um, and concrete where, it, you know, strength, structures, failures. Uh, concrete's an interesting substance. So it's unique to see the hemp hempcrete houses come up. Um, is there anybody doing hempcrete in Canada on any sort of level? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, there are lots of, there are a lot of companies that are starting to do that, but nobody has done an actual house on their property or like as a guest house. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest, my, my farmhouse is probably has not been touched up since the 80s. And I heard a big thumb the other day and I was like, oh my gosh, what is that? And I like stood around and I was like, nope, everything's fine. It was the beautiful stone falling off of my um, chimney. And it's yeah. because it was stuck onto the brick and mortar. Had it be done with hempcrete, it would not have decayed like that. Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. Right? No, it's amazing how, how it works. Um, you know, the biofuel is another amazing market. Uh, I don't think a lot of people discuss it as much as, as it could be discussed because, you know, we we are so stuck in this oil kind of a, a fuel market. You know what I mean? Um, so with the biofuel, what's the process? You know, enlighten, enlighten the listeners right now on on what biofuel is because is it, is it exactly like people are thinking it is? The sound of it? Is it something that we can use in cars? Like how, what's the future of biofuel look like to you? Oh my gosh, I will be totally, totally honest. I would be speculating if I said that I knew exactly because that's my new, my new fun project is learning about that. 
Mm. But I do know that dating back to the 1920s, that yes, that fuel was viable for any vehicle that was using. So I'm kind of now trying to bridge the gaps in between, well, why, why was that stopped? And why, or rather, how do we re-implement that? Mm-hmm. So I, I will definitely, when I find out all the information, I'll send it to even your listeners. <laughs> well, I know, you know, we talk about things that happened before Prohibition, like, you know, Ford had a car that was literally built out of hemp and ran on hemp fuel, right? So not only did he build a car out of hemp, and it was it a drivable, workable car, it actually ran off of hemp fuel. Um, so there, there is a, a, a big use for hemp fuels out there. Um, it seems like nowadays, and we've talked about the last few years, it seems like everybody's going for the, the, the green push. We're all trying to get off of these, you know, the petroleum-based uh, fossil fuels that, that we are using up in a, a rapid pace. And, and as we see, kind of control the world and our, our finances in a way as well. Um, now, you're saying COVID. Um, what, what effects have you seen with COVID besides just, you know, this, we're all Zooming now, right? Um, as far as business goes, has, it, has your business been affected by it? Has it, have you seen it go up? Because, I mean, it seems like every time we talk to somebody, we have a different story. I guess it really depends on, on where you lie within the company. Some of these companies are making twice as much money, and these other companies can barely keep the doors open. Um, and it's always interesting from a, a farmer standpoint, how, how are you guys doing up there? Well, I think to your point, I think that it depends on how much you're adhering to the protocol because there are some people that genuinely are not leaving their house and there are some that are not having anybody in their house. So that makes sense if if that's what they're up to. But from a company standpoint, it's been really difficult to not be able to do site checks at other farms that are converting and do soil analysis. And, you know, not just not have that face to face. And when you don't see the soil and feel the soil, you don't really know necessarily what you're up to. So mm-hmm. it's, it's definitely put a hindrance in it for sure. But I, and to your point also, there have been a lot of farms that thrive and, and I'm happy for them. Yep. Well, we, we, wish, we wish that for everybody. Now, one of, the, one of the big things we talked about here and with Tim in our country um, is, you know, the, the lack of support from our government as far as bailouts go or, you know, support for these industries that are, are what we consider legal operational industries in this country and, and have been considered essential businesses as well. You know what I mean? Um, are you guys getting the support from your government right now as a cannabis business? Um, well, what's interesting, okay, so we have to separate because still, in my, in my opinion, mm. Canada has not necessarily acknowledged cannabis as agriculture yet. So there's still that divide in it, right? So when you're doing a cash crop and it's wheat and it's hay and it's all that, that's agriculture. But when you're doing industrial hemp or you're doing outdoor marijuana or you're doing greenhouses, that's still considered cannabis. So I, I genuinely disagree with that. And I think that agriculture is still getting the help that it needs. Mm-hmm. Cannabis is still taking a back seat. And you, know, you, you were so sweet to mention that I was nominated for 40 under 40. When I heard back from the council, I was the only female, let alone cannabis company in Canada to even be nominated or even focus on that. And I was like, well, you guys need to understand that this is agriculture. It's not Mm -hmm. hippies in the backyard getting stoned. This is what we're up to. And this is making genuine moves towards making, you know, the planet a better place. And I know it sounds like a little overkill and cheesy, but that's what our farmers are up to. And even the farmers that called BS on it prior they're slowing down and they're like, hey, like, how can I grow this? How is it good for my soil? Tell me more. So there is still that divide, but I would say for the most part, Canada, our government has been pretty helpful and I mean, trying their best in this crazy time as they can. I, I feel bad for you guys down south. I'm not gonna <laughs> lie. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Well, I mean, again, I think it's been an interesting for all of us. I mean, you know, all Americans, all Canadians, I really think it's really reflective of where you live. 
Uh, we talk about it a lot because it's like uh, we don't feel the effects here in Vermont as much as probably, you know, in New York who are still riding every day. You know what I mean? Um, and then that's not even COVID. That's, you know, the, a race issue that, you know, we have issues going on still in this country. Um, but the COVID thing, you know, it's piggybacking everything right now. And with schools coming up soon, you know what I mean? Um that's the big scare. You know what I mean? What do we do with schools? What's this thing? You know, it, it depends on your belief. If you if you believe in the conspiracies, if you believe in the government, if you believe in, in one news agency versus the other, because it, it's just, uh, I, I feel like a lot of things are getting exposed now, especially with news and media about, you know, the directives and, and ideas that people carry, which makes it very disappointing. You know what I mean? As someone who preaches in media that, that tries to educate people, um, and then to see how people are taking these things that we have and steering them in directions that, you know, it's for another cause or for another purpose, you know, um, those are long conversations. I don't want to get involved because I know we'll get, we'll fire up a few people, but, um, it has, it has, it has made a, uh, you know, how many months are we into it now? You know what I mean? We, we, five, months, five long months. I mean, again, we're through. We're we're getting through the uh, the summer now, and like you know, as as me and Tim talk a lot, and we've been talking about a lot lately, is you know the effects it's had in government right now. When we're trying to get laws passed and bills passed and and things set up, you know, we saw the effect it took on uh, our bill here in Vermont. We saw the effect it took in New Hampshire as well, where they end up just panning the bills, you know. Um, and for us, we have to start over. So you know. Well, it's just crazy times. And now, again, like, as you've seen, we have the presidential election coming up. And <laughs> uh, it doesn't look good, you know, for cannabis. So um, I, hate, I hate to say that. Um, I hope everybody's getting ready for, for to vote this year, which is going to be huge. Um, but, you know, as far as, you know, us in the industry, you know, it's been interesting. Like we said, you know, some people are, are really having great success in the industry. Some people are having... Um, not so great success. I think opening it up as a um, as a commodity, basically a, a needed business, an essential business, was was really a great thing for lots of people. You know what I mean? But then you know, it just it's it's been kind of crazy in America in the last five months, to say the, the least, right? Um, and I know in, in Canada it's all been the same because this is not just something subject to America. But you know now we have our race war, our, our race issues, and now we have the COVID issues. And now uh, I don't think anybody's even paying attention to anything going on. Everybody's just kind of trying to stay alive right now and keep things going. Um, and you know, and now we have a money issue. You know what I mean? I, I was in Walmart the other day, and I have one lane that I could use cash in. So it's like. You know, is this is this going to be where does this bring our industry again when you know we're basically a cash business, right? Um, Tim, that's one thing I want to talk to you about at some point today was seeing these common trends, and uh, you know, you and Canada can also chime in on this because I don't know what the Can Canadian issue is. It was you know, uh, how, we're trying to eliminate cash, right? Um, and as we all know, we're we're basically a cash business, right? Well, as I mean, far as we're trying to eliminate cash. We currently have a bit of a paranoia about things going back and forth between people, and there is a change shortage. But I don't think that amounts to wanting to do away with cash altogether. I... Let's just talk about digital currencies, and we're seeing it, man. Like even right down to like the WalMarts and, and the and the mobiles, like you know, they're, digital they're... currencies or debit cards. I, you know, I don't think many people are very comfortable with digital currencies. How many people are actually going out buying Bitcoin? How much of a, you know, how easy is it to go to the store and buy something with Bitcoin or with Dogecoin or with any of the other millions of coins? You know, I think that's set to a very specific subgroup of people. Tacky is IT, people who, you know, are crypto investors, but that's a minority. Uh, most people use debit cards uh, yeah. or credit cards. You know, that's where we're, if we're going to anything, it is, yes, definitely more of a, you know, let's use a card, let's, but doing away with cash all oh. together, I think this position, um, to, uh, extremist conclusion to draw from based what's happening right now. What's happening now is people just don't really want to be handing things back and forth, whether it's right or wrong. Uh, personally, I think that's taken a little bit too far. Um, but of course, we all have our own ideas about this pandemic and what's right <laughs> and what's not right and good and bad and all that. So who knows? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I don't like to take it to the extremes, Joe. I'm going to call you out. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's what I'm saying, though. But, like, you know, it, these are some of the conversations I had lately with some business owners was in concern, you know what I mean? Um, and then, like I said, I haven't seen the effect of it yet. I've seen it online. I've seen people post stuff. And like I said, I went to Walmart the other day, and I almost thought I couldn't, you know, purchase my purchases. So because 
even the, the quick lanes don't even take a cash. You know what I mean? And, and there's not yeah, even yeah. a person there. You know what I mean? Put it in the machine. You got you were able to get your purchase though. Right? You didn't have to walk through a person, which was the funniest thing right now, because they just took it away from all the people that have you go through these machines to do the cash things and have the transactions all done there to now take you away from the machines and have you go back to a person to, to spend the, your cash with that person. I'm like, why, why won't you just use the machine? Nobody's touching it. Like you said, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. it, it collects and distributes. So, I mean, en enough of all that. Um, you know, the thing we're talking about now is, is cannabis, right? Hemp. So, um, and the unique things about biofuels, like I've been talking about biofuels a lot. So that's why I'm really interested in this conversation. Um, because I mean, we could be heating our houses on biofuels. We could be running cars off of biofuels, right? Uh, heavy equipment could be run off biofuels. Um, there's, there's, there's certain things now that are being run off biofuels. Um, now, now, Tim, can you tell me anything a little bit on the legality side of biofuels, and at least in America, is, is, is this a substantial business that is going? Is there any laws against it? Because I know no laws uh, against it. There's just an entire petrochemical industry against it. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, it, but no, no there are laws. I mean, that was the great thing about the 2018 Farm Bill, as far as the U.S. It's cannabis. If it contains less than 0.3 percent delta nine THC. It's hemp, and uh, anything derived from it is legal. Um, still, some law enforcement in certain parts of the country need to get that memo. Uh, but from a you know from a legal perspective, um, no, you know, go full steam ahead. Uh, it's just you know is profitable, and that's what anybody cares about these days, especially in the United States, is how much money am I going to make from it? Uh, and the answer is right now, not much money. Uh, you could do some good. You could uh, take out you know uh, it would be great for the environment. It would be great to get away, you know, another one, yet another component of breaking away from the fossil fuel addiction we have. Um, mm -hmm. Is it going to happen? What I imagine will happen is a more enlightened country is going to try to jump on it and make it work. And then once we see that, oh, it's working over there, <laughs> is there any way we can make money off it? That answer is yes, then we'll adopt it. If the answer is no, we won't, you know, and it's unfortunate. Maybe I'm a little cynical about it at this point, um, but it's I'd be a great idea. Um, but yep. you get into the whole thing like ethanol uh, and the corn subsidies and the politics that's behind our en energy industry, whether it's, you know, gasoline, whether it's biofuels, whether it's ethanol, whether, you know, all of this. Um, there's so much embedded bureaucracy and money and industry and connections between politicians and the, you know, oil and gas industry. I mean, you know, they jump back and forth between lobbying and con Congress and there. <laughs> it's pretty ridiculous. Um, yeah. Trump's appointed, uh, you know, CEOs of gas and drilling companies to <laughs> the EPA. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, so it's, uh, you know, yes, it's legal. Is it viable? I don't know. You know, we've also had a ban. It's only been legal for two years. So unlike Canada, that you know, where hemp has always been pretty much legal, if I'm not mistaken, hemp and non, you know, the stuff doesn't get you high that the rest of the world understands you can make things with. Um, you know, has a has the industry, has the machines necessary, has the processing, has the ability to take the raw hemp and convert it into a product. We here mm. in the United States don't. It was illegal for seven years, so we never developed those. We never developed the processing. We never developed the refining capabilities or that technology. Um, mm -hmm. So we're behind the ball. But yeah. I'd like to what see that. You, you know, Thomas and, and Tim, you know, the one thing I want to bring up is, you know, we talked to the John Dvorak, right? Um, and he gave us a very helpful insight to the, the early hemp industry when we went to Prohibition, where we were standing there. And a lot of people had kind of, I think, uh, a different image on on where we were as, as a uh, a country in hemp production, right? Because as we saw, the numbers were failing, slowly failing down. They were moving to other subsidies. Um, now, hemp can be made into biodiesel and then ethanol as well. So, um, and ethanol, you know, is also made from, you know, barley's, wheats, and grains. Um, so, and that's where we get our fuels from, right? Um, and then also sugarcane. So, like in Brazil, and, and, you know, probably 10 years ago, I had friends of mine in Brazil tell me about how, you know, their gas stations have methane, propane, fuel and biofuel so you actually get these options so the, we have we do have countries and states that have been using these fuels for for many years now um and some cars can even run on 100 percent ethanol which is also a derivative of hemp right um so hemp actually has a good chance of being something that could be sustainable in in, in our industry instead of the, the the corn which was something that we kind of went to in in in, in as a as a mechanic and a 
you know, we've seen many issues. If you ever have a lawnmower that sits over the winter that doesn't need to run because next, you know, the next summer you have to rebuild the carburetor because of your ethanol and your gas. Um, you know, it, it, there's been some issues. Um, now, you know, is there, is there, you know, any drawbacks from using biofuels? I mean, really, I can't think of anything. Um, everything's obviously coming off of a farm. It, it's an organic product. You know what I mean? Like we just said, the biggest problems that we've seen is we don't have the manufacturing for it on a, on a, on a, on a large scale level. Right. Um, how much biomass does it take to make a gallon of biofuel though? Does anybody know? I would be speculating to be honest. I, I, honest, I honestly don't know off the top of my head, Joe, um, but I, I'm right with Tim along the lines of, uh, you know, not really progressing until, uh, the country thinks that we can actually make money off it. Unfortunately, uh, way too many Americans uh, live with uh, money in mind first. And when it comes down to it, um, I've been working with a, a couple of guys that are actually trying to figure out a way to uh, develop small scale ethanol uh, extract, or excuse me, develop ethanol uh, on a small scale from uh, hemp so that they can actually turn around and use that same ethanol for their ethanol extractions for their medicines. But at the same time, if they're not able to develop it at a cost effective way, it becomes null and void and they might as well just be uh, scrapping or um, composting uh, what they have left over at that point anyway. Right. I mean, um, it, that's a question. Like, I mean, did, when we, after we talked to John, I raised this question now with it all, you know what I mean? Cause when you look at that, that industry, it's, it's corn, barley, um, wheat, um, can we make it cheaper than is hemp cheaper than that? You know, how's it, how's it resort out to that? Um, I, I know we have a lot of applications for hemp, but like we can't make every application for it. Cause we can only, you know, how much can we grow? Can we keep up with stocks? How, like I said, how much does it cost to create a gallon of biofuel? You know well, what I mean? I, it's just I can tell you this, I can tell you this much in comparing corn, uh, to hemp as far as creating biofuel, um, it's going to be tough because when it comes down to it, corn is considerably easier to grow, uh, doesn't require uh, as much um, necessities as far as care and uh, nutrients um, as hemp is concerned, unless you're looking at uh, more of an industrial uh, fiber style hemp. But uh, if, I mean, if somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that uh, a CBD rich, bud rich, um, full product hemp like we grow in the US is going to produce a much better biofuel in the end than uh, a fiber stock. Uh, therein lies uh, another issue for you, though, at that point is because in order to grow that CBD rich, uh, bud rich, nice looking uh, dense bud, you have to put more time and effort into it. You have to put more money into it. You have to put into irrigation, greenhouses, etc. And at this point in time, unless somebody can come up with a viable way to convert that into um, ethanol, I don't see it as uh, happening anytime soon for the U.S. What <clears throat> Again, John brought up a great point when we had him on the show about how even with hemp and um, THC grows, right, that the stocks are still viable products for fibers and fuels, right? So Absolutely. a lot of the biomass that we are, all of our farms are throwing away that, you know, didn't get threw away last summer, right? Because did you do anything with your bio, your, your fibers last year? I did. I ended up finding somebody because I'm a huge believer in using every aspect of the plant, which is why I'm such a fan of the new. So I did end up finding somebody who wanted literally just the biomass because it was it was viable to them at that point. Mm -hmm. And to answer your question, I googled it. It says um, approximately an acre of hemp can produce 226 pounds of oil, depending on the genetic. To answer there your question. So now is it viable? You know what I mean? Um, and I know, and, and, and you know, we have you on now because you know you made you made this transition. You looked into it, um, and it's a, it's another big step for you, right? Um, because it's a, it's another transition after a few years of being going and what you're doing, um, which is unique. And I love how you took that take that approach uh, uh, because that's the one thing we talk about is the waste, the byproducts. You know what I mean? How do we reduce our byproducts? How do we utilize? those byproducts, the roots, the stalks, the stems, because, you know, people don't realize how valuable those are um, and what they can do for the industry and various other aspects. We can make plastics, we can make oils, we can make hempcrete, you know what I mean? Um, I mean the sky's the limit, baby, on that one. And that's why we love your outlet so much, because people don't pay attention to that. They think, oh, we're going to throw it away. 
Why would you throw it away? That makes no sense. Everything is viable about this plant. That's why it's so beautiful. Well, I think I'll think Tom and, and Tim will vouch for this. I think what we the biggest problem we've seen is the issue of people just don't know what to do with it, right? Um, what do you do with it? Is what you know people are asking us. You know what I mean? Uh, it's like when they you know we we see a bunch of farmers that are just like I'm going to transition my farm, throw a bunch of seeds in the ground, and boom, here we go. What do we do with it? You know, they never they never figured out the end plan. They never figured out who, what, where, and how to sell it, you know what I mean? Um, so people get stuck with it. It's kind of like what we were talking about before, you know, it's like how many people ask us, how do we get in the game? What do we do with these products? Because it's a lot about, it. it's, it's you know, if you're just growing for a bud, you're thinking about the stock, right? Unless you're you're kind of in a health and wellness kind of a person, you know what I mean? Um, Thomas, how many people that you know that you've helped harvest it that just throws that stuff away or burns it? Well, luckily for, for me, uh, none of them that actually listen anymore actually throw them away. Uh, when they started uh, growing on their own, um, there were definitely a few of the farms that I worked with that were uh, trashing uh, their stocks. And I actually found a couple of farms that were just leaving them in a giant pile in the middle of the field because they had no idea what to do. Uh, so you drive past the field and you just see this big pile that looked like it was a pile of hay and it was really actually stocks. Um, so I started working with a bunch of them and having them either uh, process it into uh, some sort of medicine, whether it be uh, into a CBD oil itself or um, selling it to somebody that was interested in processing it into fiber stock. Um, but a lot of what we've actually been working with uh, this year uh, has plants actually be sold to a company that's working uh, for CBD dog treats. So they actually want to take the stocks and develop a, a lower a milligram a CBD treat for dogs uh, based off using the actual stocks themselves. I think they plan on uh, decarbing them and turning the actual stocks into the treats themselves. No. Uh, we've had quite a few comments say so shout out to everybody who's uh commenting um i'm half paying attention because we're doing 18 other things and trying to get the shows out um but a lot of people are wondering about the 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 what the industry requires for machinery to do this now from everything that we've talked about in the, in over the last few years the that's the problem you know what i mean that's why 90% of what we see on American soil is coming in from China and probably 8% from Europe and then, you know, maybe 1% one to 2% from America because we only have one hemp processing facility here, right? So it's cheaper for them to, to bring it to China, process it there, and then bring it back here to sell as materials, right? Because we, we've, we've all seen the hemp shirts. We've all seen the hemp sneakers. I've got a few pairs, but if you read the labels, they're all made in China, right? Uh, we just do not have the manufacturer in this country. And like Tim was saying before, a lot of it, you know, falls back on the legality of, of, of where it's, where the industry has been for the last few years. Um, and then when we talk about investments to get a hemp processing machine, uh, it's a huge investment. And then, then again, we look at the markets. We talk about sustainability, uh, you know, what, like, like Thomas mentioned, you know, I mean, these are the things that I think we, as people kind of overlook when we look at the, the beauty of all what cannabis can do is corn's fucking cheap. You know what I mean? Uh, we don't have the nutrient. It grows anywhere. What the fuck? We can't stop it from growing. You know what I mean? Uh, but then in, into the response to that, Thomas, I, I believe there's strains out there that are are literally perfect strains for these certain things. And, and you know, we, we've talked to Aaron a few years ago um and and they were one of the first people we had on that were really going after the the fiber side of, of cannabis like no one was talking about it back then either and i still don't think anybody's talking about it enough today um you know a lot of these major companies like levi's are making these these hemp products and they're figuring out ways to make them softer right um we're realizing that when we add hemp to bamboo it makes it one of the, the the most awesomest materials that you could ever put on your body um antibacterial it, it's it, it wicks the moisture from your body um easy to clean and the fibers are way nicer than kind right so you know it, it's it's interesting to see whether the how the industry turns and biofuels is where i love hearing because i mean you know years ago i did a methane experiment and when we talk about you know thomas you brought up a, a good point earlier about it being about money i have to disagree i have to say it's about power and control because uh we burn methane let's use methane gas for a, a quick example here we burn methane every little fire you see off every um trash pit that you drive by you know what i mean is methane right so that's a biofuel like that can be that can run your car that can run your house and we just sit there and let it burn because our oil industry has such a stranglehold on everything and especially in america that 
that's not a viable option for us. What do you mean it's not a viable option? We're literally burning it and it's getting made for free in the grounds below all of our, our trash areas, you know what I mean? All of our dumps, all, all of our processing facilities because it's just natural methane, right? We talk about compost and, and what does compost do? Do Thomas, we're building methane, right? We're putting methane in our soil. We're we're, we're building organisms. We're putting that stuff in there. Um, so, I guess the only thing I would disagree with you on, Joe, is I guess the power versus money, because to me they're the same thing. Well, I guess. I mean, but like you know, how think, think about. It. I mean, how, how many of the oil companies are poor? How many of the oil None. companies have a shit ton of money? A lot well, of them. Don't. Why? because they have the power. Why do they have the power? Because they have the money. Mm -hmm. If they have the money to throw around, they can develop more power on their own. They can buy the people in office that they want. Well, I mean, when we, we want to start this conversation, we can bring it right to the prohibition <laughs> again. You know what I mean? Because again, right. you know, look at prohibition, how it started, whether it was race, uh, power, corporate, or government based, it all kind of ties into to the same couple different philosophies that all kind of came to head at one point in time you know what i mean and like Fair we enough. said it kind of was like hey look at where the industry was it's an easy disconnect man there was no money in that industry like you said it's about power and money so when there's no money coming in from that industry on an american level then they pulled the plug on it they went to corn you know what i mean like you said it's an agricultural crop that at that time was making more money you know what i mean because we're, we're importing hemp at that point in time now canada probably has a far vast different history obviously than than america does when it comes to prohibition canvas laws and, and how it how it got to there which would be a conversation i'd love to understand it someday um because I, I don't know, you know what I mean? Uh, I just see Canada as like the hot spot for a lot of things in cannabis the last few years. Um, and it, it's been really interesting to watch because a lot of our companies have jumped in, over the border, but and then we had our border issues, which, you know, Danica, are, do we still have border issues for you guys working yes, with sir. companies? Oh my goodness, yes, I know sir. you're everywhere, you know? And, and this is a question for Tim, like how, how are these companies pulling it off? I mean, we, we, we bring it up here and there when we see these big companies come in and buy a big chunk and part of New York and, and the Suffolk grow. You know what I mean? We've seen a couple of Canadian companies do that. Um, is it still the same as it's been for the last year for you guys with working with American companies? And then how are the Canadian companies partnered with American companies? How's that working right now? Is that for me or for Tim? Uh, both actually. I'll start with you first and I'll let Tim come in and, 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 and give us his 15 cents. Okay, yes, yeah, no, I, I'm dying to hear about that because it's been honestly a nightmare. And even from last season, we had a genetic coming in that helped Canada approve. And it's Carminola, and it got stuck at customs three times, like sent back to France, back and forth. A, that's such a waste of our money. B, that makes no sense. Like, I, I have all my permits, my Health Canada license, all that good stuff. It still never got even remotely sent back. So we've still not seen Carmenola. In terms of borders, I can't get anything from the US border. I can't even get our sweet friend Ellen Brown, our like our cultivator of edge like all that good stuff over the border. And anytime that you try to like contact somebody, it's no, they don't know. They they'll get somebody to contact you. So it's it is being really, really interesting, hmm. to say the least. I mean, to be diplomatic about it. Right. I mean, now we have a, a pretty strict border closure due to COVID. So there's nothing going back and forth. Even before COVID. Like, we're, we're yeah. talking cannabis as a whole. This is even before COVID. So that's the stressful about it. Everyone wants to lean into it and be like, oh, well, your genetics can't come down because of COVID and because of that this is being going on simply because of cannabis regulations and how the fact that we cannot get our our border, um, I guess. What what we're up to because the U.S. every single person that I speak to in the U.S. is like, we want these genetics that you have in Canada, and I'm like, that's amazing because I want these genetics that you have, and we're like, can we like you know like pog yeah. trade? No, we cannot at all legally. And I and I think I told you this the last time that we spoke on your show that there were a few people that were like, hey, we'll just slap a different name on the series and send it through. And I was like, well, here's the thing. 
eventually, I really, really hope that somebody is smart enough to notice that, that if the highest yield of CBD that we're seeing in Canada is 7% on average, and all of a sudden, southwestern Ontario is yielding 27%. I would really <laughs> hope that somebody calls BS. So there's still those people that are getting it across the border, but I, I'm not on that team. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we, you know, there's ways that things have happened in this industry that make things work. I mean, I know we can order seeds, but no, that's interesting because, like, you know, when we talk about trades and the border, um, you know, like when they closed the border to all of the CBD industry, the campus industry, you had Ellen working with you, right? So, so Ellen's up there working with you. And that, that was like, we had her on the show at that point in time. And she was like saying the same thing. Like, I don't know. You know what I mean? I'm here. I'm not in jail and I'm going back on this date. So, um, but it's, it's been really interesting to see that, 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 how that relationship is. Now, Tim, we haven't talked about this issue for a long time, actually in the show. Um, the border, right? Let's 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 discuss the border. We're pretty much in the same position we've been for the last what was it about a year now since they've really made that mandate, right? Um, yeah, the border. It's been it's been a little bit crisscross. I won't I won't lie because certain things are are going kosher, certain things are not. But for the most part, I and since day one, I've had an American employee, and that has always been the case. And I've had immigration papers and all of all of the necessary mandates of paperwork. Yay! But since COVID, that's a no-go. You cannot even cross the border, and it doesn't actually let that reflect in your company. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, my company is now suffering because I cannot have my employee come over, whether quarantine or not. Mm -hmm. It makes no sense. But and I'm, it's not just me. It's like dispensaries, it's other companies. Um, I feel very blessed actually because I'm on the farm, so I'm I'm just growing hemp, and we're we're going to figure that out. But mm -hmm. for other companies in Canada, it's it's not been necessarily fruitful and I mean even if it was something that's not cannabis related the borders it's it's definitely a hindrance to everybody and I don't know if Tim or Tom can join in on that because it for us in Canada it has been a bit of a pain in the butt right well I know it was a hop on subject when you know Canada went legal um, and then we, it seems like we haven't heard anything, but I just, I keep seeing Canadian companies here, Canadian companies there. Um, how is that working, Tim, right now? Well, you can't bring pot over the border. Um, well, you yeah. bring pot over the border. <laughs> you could never, it's Don't still- do it. Don't in, try to do it. In <laughs> the United States. Um, Canada actually classifies CBD as still a cannabis product. Um, mm. Part of Canada's national legalization uh, much like any legislatively passed legislation, there's some really good and there's some really bad. Uh, and one of the not so great components of it, A, is CBD is still classified as a cannabis product and there are some incredibly strict penalties for import-export without proper licenses. Um, mm -hmm. You can export, you can import. It just needs to be done through the proper legal channels, not into the U.S. though. Remember, this is what we always come back to. In the United States, cannabis, marijuana, Schedule One controlled substance, heroin, methamphetamine, ecstasy. That's what we consider. So, it, you know, that's the problem. Business does not need necessarily to bring cannabis over the border. Um, you, we live in the internet age. You can have an office in New York and an office in Toronto. Uh, I had this. Um, a lot of companies are based in Canada trade uh, publicly on the Canadian Stock Exchange, um, which is a much easier listing. Now, you cannot get listed on a US stock exchange if you sell marijuana in the United States, because that's an illegal activity. If you sell marijuana cannabis in Canada, like Canada Grove um, or Aurora, sure, you can list because you're not breaking the law. You're following the law and you are conducting business legally within Canada. Um, it's just, it's once it crosses the line. That's why the canopy deal acreage or canopy growth acreage deal uh, is conditioned on legality in the United States. Because if they were to bond now, uh, canopy growth would get kicked off. Uh, because medical sales 
still are federally illegal, technically, our wonderful system we have here. Um, so, you know, then the border is the border. Uh, it sucks. I miss going to Montreal. You know, COVID actually really just stopped tourism, uh, me and you, from crossing. It, business still is going. Shipping is still going. There's still trucks of uh, goods going. Um, you know, essential businesses, essential transactions can still cross the border. It's pretty much just tourism that got shut down. Um, but yeah, uh, as you know, uh, Danica was saying, this cannabis thing goes way before COVID. I mean, it's always been a pain in the ass. What really problematic is if you start getting interrogated about what you do for a living. Um, because if you work in the industry, you can technically be banned from admittance by US Customs. Uh, another interesting little quirk U.S. Customs agents have an incredible amount of autonomy to ask the questions they want. There's no standard questions they need to ask. They also have an incredible amount of leniency about who they allow to, into the country. So we don't have consistent guidelines. We don't have, okay, this is what you can do. This is what you can say. This is what you can't say. There's no black line law. It really is up to the determination of the individual customs agent. They want to let you in, they're going to let you in. They don't want to let you in, they're not going to let you in. Um, and that's really what it comes down to. And there have been people who work in the industry who've never smoked pot in their lives. They're business people. They conduct, you know, they, they carry briefcases and wear suits and, you know, they have nothing to do with the, you know, other than to work, say, as a accountant for Aurora or a mm -hmm. sales manager for, you know, Canopy Growth, one of the non cannabis uh, non marijuana uh, subsidies. Mm -hmm. And they've been banned. And they've been told they can't come in because they derive income from an illegal revenue source, blah, 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 as if they were, you know, uh, uh, heroin dealers. Um, so, you know, now that hasn't been widespread. There have been several instances we could look at, uh, and those have been called out pretty loud in the public. And there are processes by which that can be what's called rehabilitation in Canada. You get rehabilitated. You, uh, yeah. you, so you can get past that stuff. It's just a real hit. Um, and it can, it, it, it chills the industry. You don't want to have that cross border if you're going to worry about your COO getting, you know, picked up. Uh, and possibly banned from ever going back. So they'll lie and they'll say they're going to see family or they're going on uh, unrelated business. I'm a farm equipment salesman. Uh, now you're lying to a federal agent and committing a felony, but it's a catch-22, you do. You know, you gotta conduct business. It's, so it, it's just yet another reason why the cannabis industry is, is an industry that's handcuffed. You know, that's mm -hmm. why it's really difficult. You, cross-border issues, transport issues, 280E tax issues in the United States, listing on public uh, traded uh, stock exchanges in the United States. All of these things that most businesses take for granted, that most businesses just assume is there for them and that they never even have to think twice about. Um, all of this is uh, you know, a real challenge, if at all, available to the cannabis industry. Yep. No, it, it's it, getting it, better. CBD is getting better here. You know, I would say that we are on a better track with CBD and hemp, at least CBD products than Canada is. Uh, we're at least not classifying as a controlled substance anymore. We have, you know, but what about Delta 8? What about Delta 10? I'm writing an article right now on Delta 8 THC um, and whether or not that would be considered a controlled substance. Uh, you yeah. know, and they have really strong arguments on both sides of that point. Uh, but yet we have clients extracting. We have clients who want to know if they can start selling it over the counter. Yeah. I mean, right now, Delta oh, Eight oh, is technically oh, legal, right? I mean, that—that's the issue with Delta Eight, right? Now, is Delta Eight technically legal right now? Delta Nine THC is a controlled substance, or okay. uh, let's 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 be exact. Cannabis right. sativa containing greater than 0.3 percent THC is a controlled substance. Delta Eight is in there. Mm -hmm. uh, source rule from the Farm Bill says if you extract it from cannabis containing less than 0.3% THC, it's legal, hence CBD. Mm. So by that reasoning, Delta-8 extracted from hemp, as long as you have a COA showing that it's extracted from hemp, should be legal. But by that same reasoning, THC extracted from hemp should be legal, and that's just how it uh, Because they bring in the argument of legislative intent. That was not the legislative intent. And the Controlled Substances Act has a little tiny paragraph, I think it's in section 27C, if I remember correctly, which says that Substances in Schedule 1 and 2 are not, the lists are not in, uh, exclusive, meaning they're not, that's, you know, there are other things that could potentially fall in them. And they describe that as a compound or a, you know, a, with a molecular similarity, which has the same or greater psychoactive effect. So a derivative, a compound made from it, you know, if you had some sort of new opiate you came up with, the standard would be if it got you as high or higher, and have the same or a similar or greater psychoactive effect 
that is automatically going to fall within schedule one. Mm -hmm. So a derivative, say CBD, I don't think anybody can with a straight face make the argument that CBD is as psychoactive or more psychoactive than Delta 9 THC. It's not, but it's a fact. Yeah. But well, in that, in that respect, Tim, can't, can't they still, shouldn't they be able to make the, the same claim on, on Delta 8? Right. Um, that's, having really, tried that, that's the claim that would have to be made. Is right. that has, it's, it's an analog, it's a derivative of cannabis. It was sourced from industrial hemp. And just to add the extra, it is not as or greater the psychoactive than Delta 9 THC. The problem is right. CBD is, you know, listen, we can get a little calm from it or whatever. It's not a psychoactive substance. It's, it's a modulating molecule. It doesn't actually do anything itself other than to affect other cannabinoids. Uh, Delta 8 does get you to an extent yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, because now we've got, now it's subjective nature. Now we've got a subjective question. We hate subjective questions in the law. You know, is it as psychoactive or more psychoactive as Delta 9? It, I don't think so. Somebody who's never consumed it, like a prosecutor, like most prosecutors, like the prosecutor that'll be making the argument, they'll be saying Delta 8's the next heroin. They'll be saying this stuff is 30 times, 50 times, a million times more powerful. I'm talking out their ass, but it sounds good to a jury, you know? Mm -hmm. And so th there are questions about when the time comes, are courts going to find that this is illegal or it's illegal? I can't even figure this out about Delta 9 right now. We're still arguing about, you know, THCA and total theoretical THC. You know, these guys don't even know that something called Delta 8 exists or Delta 10 exists. Uh, it's going to blow their little prohibitionist minds. <laughs> Right, we'll when they see. get to that level, what, what are they going to do? You know what I mean? Legalize, um, or at least leave the states, and then problem solved. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot. There's been a lot of comments about the legality of Delta Eight, and I think that we're seeing a big push for it right now because of that. Again, that, that, that unique gray area that we we've, we've seen for so long. So you know, I mean, I'm part of the International Cannabis Bar Association. You know, I'm associated with Hogan Law. Um, we have all our listservs and, you know, cannabis lawyers, just like every other profession, all like to squabble about the latest issues and blah, 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 and everybody's opinions, because lawyers all think their opinions the best. <laughs> um, and there's a huge divide. There's a huge split uh, in the, you know, legal aspect of the cannabis world over uh, Delta-8 and on a bigger scale, uh, cannabinoids beyond CBD uh, and Delta-9 THC. Well, some, you know, some are saying they're legal under the uh, farm bill. Others are saying absolutely not. Legislative intent would never allow that. And uh, they're not legal. So we haven't yet to see a court make that decision. Um, they can barely test the THC content of edibles. Uh, we're, we're not even close to them being able to identify Delta 8 yet, but it's a matter of time. Um, and they will. And hopefully we'll have an answer someday soon. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, yeah, so that's a whole nother conversation for another show we're going to have to talk to soon. Um, I did have, though, I just want to go back because I saw this. So we're going to go back to our, our little conversation earlier about um, biofuel, right? And just real quick, and we're going to come back with Tim with another question. Let me find it right here. Uh, basically, someone did the math for us. So, Sis, thank you very much. Uh, she commented she did the math for us. So... Uh, I want I wanted to talk to you guys about this because I believe it, it's it's really unique. Um, and then you know we're getting a lot of great reactions to the comments, guys. So thank you guys for being on, very responsive, because uh, there's a lot of it's about you know what we can do with our biomass, right? You know what I mean? Like we can feed our cows. We can there's there's so many different options we can do with it. Thank um, you, yes. <laughs> Since I put that an acre of hemp can produce 226 pounds of oil, which we had pretty much figured out earlier, right? And now. Uh, if you did the math on that, uh, you'll find that a total of 1.26 billion acres of land are needed to produce um, the standard weight of uh, the diesel fuel consumption um, as we are now. So that is a lot, you know what I mean? Um, and, but we're starting to see other, you know, fuels taking over where it's electric, um, methane, propane. Um, and obviously in Canada, they have a couple different options for fuels, right? Like you don't just have gas up there, correct? Correct. So it's like propane and- We have gas, we have, I mean, we have diesel, we have all that good stuff. 
<laughs> so, and, and you, it's unique because you guys do run propane up there, right? So it's like a lot of the the, the rigs are run on propane. Um, a lot of like forklifts and construction vehicles are run on propane. Um, you know, much better for indoor usage, stuff like that. You know, natural gas, right? Um, no different than people people's heaters. Um, but I just want I wanted to bring up that 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 number, man, because when you hear that 1.26 billion acres of hemp is need to produce is need to produce be produced to cover the uh, the oil consumption in, in, in America for um, she said put September, but I don't know if it's the year or just a month, but that would be that, that's substantial. You know what I mean? Um, can it can it be a viable can it hold a viable ground in that market? You know what I mean? Um, because it, like everything, we don't want to see it come as as a small market item. Um, because you know, I did the bio oil fuels where we where you, know, you recycle the fire later fuel, you know, the canola oils, and you can run that through diesels and, and modify that as well. Um, and then I've seen the government come in and do a lot against that, you know what I mean? Because it was a taxable, people were putting in their trucks, people were putting in all their diesels, they were confiscating vehicles. Um, New Hampshire went up in arms and, 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 and tried to, to tax people. Uh, we've seen people give you tax credit to buy an electric car and then tax you heavier on it for the state for buying an electric car because you're not paying you know, the, the, the taxes for the road fees and the gas. So <laughs> we talk about what Thomas said before, you know, power greed, and it's just a, it's a big corporation that, you know, unfortunately these things can, can really, you know, be a pain in the ass to, you know what I mean? So they're not going to love us uh, to do all that. Um, no, a lot of these guys are, are funny. Who's ever told the truth at the border, right, Tim? Um, <laughs> I do. I do every time I'm Canadian. I'm so sorry every time. Right. Well, you know, here we have a, uh, you know, Stephanie's talk commenting about the freedom to choose your own health care and your own choices. I think we're going to be really put to a test here really soon when, when it comes to these vaccinations, man. Um, it's going to be really unique to That's see if it's if, what's that. Who has freedom to choose their health care? <laughs> yeah, right. I was gonna say, we don't, right? Um, there's religious choices, uh, and there's laws that goes against both all those rights. So that's what we're talking about. You know what I mean? It's like they give you the power, the the, what, the fake freedom, and they they have laws set up to, to you know, it, it's just back and forth. But anyways, um, you guys, thank you. Keep keep commenting. We're loving it. Um, Thomas, though, we have a video that we're going to get to from Thomas here shortly. I'm going to get that set up. Um, his little grower's guide. We've been going here for a little while now, so for another hour. Um, Timothy, I did want to ask you one more question before we get to that. I just have 18 pages sure. opened up right now, as we all know. Uh, but um, unions, man, I want to talk to you really quick about unions. Massachusetts right now is looking at unionizing the cannabis um, workers. Uh, is this a good idea? Is this something that can even, even happen, technically? Um, is this something that, you know, how, how, how do we proceed with unions and, and is, it, is it good is it something good for our industry because you know we've seen unions in all other industries and we've seen industries succeed with and without unions and most of them are split you know is this a good thing for cannabis you know I, I think it certainly is legal organized at the state level um there would probably may be some concern if you were trying to join a national union but like anything unions are it's no it's not a zero-sum game it's not unions are good unions are bad um Unions, like anything, can be great. Uh, the auto workers union, uh, airline pilots union, uh, teachers union. <laughs> there are some unions that really are very effective. Uh, they, they are well organized. They are transparent. They are legitimate. And they actually care about their workers' uh, needs. Then you've got the dock workers unions. <laughs> you've got the teamsters. You've got, the, you know, um, where some unions were beds of criminal activity and exploitation and extortion. Um, and did really very little for their membership other than to take their money. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the, the question, you know, are, are unions good or bad? I don't know. Are the conditions that which would need a union? Um, are cannabis industry workers underpaid? Are they being abused? Are they being made to work 18 hours a day? Uh, are there OSHA protections in place? Uh, is there a need? Um, you know, and I think that is an open question. Um, you know, based on from what I've read, at least, cannabis industry jobs are some of the best paying median starting jobs out there, mm. um, you know, right now. Now, of course, 
you know, but everything is in such flux. It's so hard to say. We can't establish a pattern. We can't look back over five years of adult use sales or that are nice steady stream and be able to say, okay, based on the amount of revenue, then the, the employees, blah, 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 blah. And that you would do again with any other industry. So hmm. I think it's too soon to tell. I, honestly, to, to answer your question in the shortest way possible, I think it's too soon to tell if unionization is necessary. Um, but if employees want to get together and they want to form an organization, who's to say no? Well, right. Why not? Well, I like how you put that, that is it necessary? You know what I mean? I mean, you, unions are really kind of put to, pulled together a uh, necessity um, for issues in that industry, correct? Um, well, most effective when there's a reason for that union to exist, which is historical underpayment, which is abuse, which is, you know, uh, shoddy uh, regulate, you know, safety regulations. Um, all of these are very important reasons to unionize. Um, <laughs> when you get into the job protection aspects of it, that starts to get on a little shakier ground. I think there can be arguments made on both sides of that. Um, mm. But when it's just forming a union for the sake of forming a union, and that union does nothing but collect dues and have a meeting once in a while, and there's nothing, there's no benefit to the member other than just to pay their dues in every month or every quarter or whatever. Um, that has to be questioned about wh why are we doing this? And I, again, like I said, I think it's too early to tell if that is a necessity. Um, but like I said, also, if they want to do it, we're not. Who's to say no? You, know? you can't organize, you can't get together and <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Uh, I mean, in the news right now, this week has been nuts. Um, you know, everything from Wyoming judges dismissing hemp charges, uh, hemp farmer charges. Uh, but the one thing that did strike me, and I, we don't normally talk politics, all right? But, you know, we kind of know where everybody stands on politics who's in the game right now. But this week we had, um, or yesterday, you know, there was announced that um, Kamala Harris is going to be the uh, the running mate to Joe Biden. Um, so this brings up an interesting question because you know the Joe Biden debate we've gone back and forth with because it seems to be you know we we, we have a general understanding where he stands right. Um, what does this do for the Democratic stance on cannabis in this upcoming election? Does this help Biden? Does this hurt Biden? Is, you know what do we know of where Kamala stands here right now? Are you talking to me? Yep. Yeah, we just did a video on this today. So Kamala yeah, Harris, you. <laughs> you know, former U.S. attorney in California, former attorney general for the state of California, prosecutor, put lots of people in jail for pot. Um, in 2014, when she was asked at a forum uh, what she thought about federal legalization, she laughed, um, which was to show you how much she really uh, thought about it. However, in the last three years, we've seen a significant switch since she got into the Senate. Uh, she signed on with Cory Booker's Marijuana Justice Act. She has uh, signed on to the CARE Act. She has signed on and pushed the Safe Banking Act. She has tweeted on multiple times. She's really turned it into a social justice um, race issue, which obviously it is. Uh, and so we've seen some very positive signs over the last few years, and enough of them consistently to really believe that, you know, once she stopped being a prosecutor, her eyes got opened a little bit to it. Um, Obviously, we know Biden's looking at decriminalization. Biden's not looking at federal legalization. It's, he's 78. They just can't get it in their heads. Just can't grip the fact. Um, she's younger. She's 55. <clears throat> Who knows? Um, the national platform for the Democrats has not taken full legalization. But again, we are not going to see appointments of people like Jeff Sessions at the, you know, as attorney general. We are not going to see a Senate majority leader who is just absolutely adamantly opposed to getting uh, these bills, which have bipartisan support for the most part, through. Um, so we're going to see, hopefully, <laughs> oh God, we have a decent uh, outcome of elections in November. We're going to see a fundamental shift in the mechanisms uh, which will allow legalization, or at least, uh, you know, all right, we're going to go on record on statute and say banks will not be prosecuted for money laundering for working with the cannabis industry, and states are allowed to do what they want. That is what I really believe is going to happen. The federal government is not going to tell the Bible Belt states they have to legalize pot. It's just never going to happen, you know, no matter who's in charge. So mm -hmm. let it be the states. If Alabama wants to, God forbid, keep, you know, locking people up, great. I'm not going to Alabama. Um, yeah. But let the states and let the people, let those ballot initiatives go through. Let the states decide for themselves and give us federal assurances that 
we this is in statute now in law it's not a rider it's not an amendment it's not an opinion it's not a, you know all of this kind of wishy-washy stuff that we've seen it's statutorily defined we will not up with you if you are complying with state law uh, and that is you know that should be a no-brainer that mm. should be easy because the Republicans were fighting this the most. They always talk about 10th Amendment, states' rights. This is what they've been saying about abortion for the last 30 years. This is leave it to the states, leave it to the states, leave it to the states. Fine. Comes to marijuana policy. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. We need to go right. around flash bangs and fucking killing people and their pets. Or you know, seen that right now, the, the banking provisions relate to the COVID-19 bill, right? I mean, that's another discussion that, you know, we, we that's been going on for the last week. Um, where even you know the vice president Pence just the other day was slamming the uh, the bill for the marijuana provisions that were, were within it, right? Um, and we talked about it last week because you know we we kind of we kind of chuckle at these things because we know they're not going to get anywhere, right? Um, but we're, what we're what we're starting to see is more and more and more bipartisanship on 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 the on these issues, right? And, and why can't we get it by? And you know we we had a pretty in depth conversation about it last week, um, and like you said, uh, Mitch McConnell, you know what I mean? We have we have issues in the Senate, right? So that's why everybody has to, to to realize. I mean, as much as we talk about how great. Um, some of these, you know, the safe banking acts are, the, you know, the marijuana banking acts that they're bringing to the table and these provisions that they're trying to get into these bills, why they keep, why they keep getting taken out. You know what I mean? Why, why do they keep getting bypassed? Just because you, within that bill, like we discussed last week, it's probably not going to go nowhere, right? Um, and they know that. So, yeah, you know, as much as we, we, we see this, guys, uh, in the news, it's something that, you know, like, like Tim's, and we all keep saying, don't, don't get too excited for it. Um, but, Again, we set another record last month in Illinois on legal pot sales. Again, huge. It's so. I mean, guys, you got you and and and, and it, it, what we gotta say? Like we're talking to to uh, you know Danica earlier and everybody on the panel. You know, the, the industry is going crazy still. So COVID hasn't. You know, where does COVID play in the effect on the industry? Um, now, Vermont made it in the news a couple of days ago, Tim. Let's talk about this. You know, they made. They, they Are you made, talking about the marijuana moment? Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Marijuana Can I explain moment? the background for that? Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm excited. I'm excited. The, the editor of Marijuana Moment um, is a very, very, very good friend of our own Dave Silverman. Um, and that comment that was quoted in Marijuana Moment was given to them by Silverman, who got it when he in typical Dave Silverman fashion, called up a public forum where Mitzi Johnson and our chief of staff were uh, talking about completely unrelated issues. And out of the blue, pinned her down on uh, TV about, so, about that marijuana bill you've been holding up for the last year. Uh, and that was their on-air, unexpected, stumbling, stuttered <laughs> response, which Dave Silverman then fed to marijuana moment immediately. So and I've heard a lot of people the last couple of days go, oh, Vermont's going. <laughs> no, no. Is there a chance in Vermont we're going to get through this year? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it a good chance? No. Is it a slim chance? No. Is it a microscopic chance? <laughs> yes, microscopic. Okay. Um, you know, and it's just simply not a priority right now to establish a cannabis industry in Vermont. It's just not what the politicians are looking at. Um, mm -hmm. They're looking at COVID. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of states. Arizona just got their ballot initiative approved. New Jersey got their ballot initiative approved. Uh, North Dakota, it looks like, is getting their ballot initiative approved. Yes. Uh, Mississippi, <laughs> our expansion of their medical program just got approved. Now some bad news. Idaho uh, were unable to get their signatures yeah. because of COVID. Uh, Missouri had to drop their plans because they weren't able to get their signatures to the ballot initiative. But they're refocusing on 2022. This mm -hmm. is happening at the state level. More, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you I mean, know, you look at that... all the ballot initiatives over the last yeah. five years, I can only think of two that have failed. Yeah. You know, in Arizona in 2016 was, you know, 58, uh, 52 to 48. And now they've got 60 percent, you know. So this is happening. We will uh, by the state, by state, by state. And New Jersey is going to be huge for us because once New Jersey flips, that's going to be the by far largest adult use market on the East Coast. Yep. And it is going to force New York to act. It's going to be holding right there. off and stumbling because they have no pressure to do so. Massachusetts does not have an, even an, any impact on New York. New Jersey is yep. an enormous impact on New York. 
So once they legalize, I fully expect, uh, and once New York goes and Jersey goes, Pennsylvania goes next. Uh, once mm-hmm. Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey are going, Florida will go. And then, then now it's playing catch up. Now it's yeah. all of a sudden, oh, well, they're in it. Now I got to be in it too. Um, yeah. And that's going to set off the kind of chain reaction on the East Coast, which will, you know, inevitably at that point, sure, maybe a couple of Bible Belt states, maybe Indiana, you still can't smoke dope, but pretty much anywhere where 90% of the population lives, you can. Um, yeah. And that, you know, that's going to be the most realistic path we in the United States have towards legalization. We're not going to get what Canada did. Uh, which was, hey, let's make this legal at a national level. We're going to overregulate the shit out of it. It's going to take us a year to work out all the kinks and get everything. But you know what? They're doing a great job. When I first went to Quebec, uh, you know, Montreal, when they first opened dispensaries, it's a nightmare. Uh, the last time I went in January, right before the shutdown, brilliant. Walked down from the hotel, went right in, waited in line 10 minutes, had a great selection. Um, you know, and so you could see in just that 12 month time period, they, like any new industry, worked the kinks out and started getting it rolling. And they still need mm-hmm. to figure some stuff out, but you know, at least they're on the right path. Once you pass the law, you can fix what's wrong with it. This yeah. is the concept we've had here in Vermont on the micro level that people just can't grasp their heads around. That's a horrible way to do things. No, no, no. You're never going to do work. anything about legislation. You're <laughs> yeah. never going to get a perfect bill through. Get something through, then start to fix the problems. Yeah. Uh, no, we. We, we've been we've been preaching this for a few years, Tim, and and, and and we hear that now. Another couple of questions I have now. We talk about legalization, and you know our guest is is from Canada, right? We're talking about the border issues. Has there been any language in any of these bills about opening that border up, like our our, our federal border to Canada and and Mexico for trade? You know what I mean? Because that's that's the one thing we've talked about a lot. Um, and Danica is up here talking about how she can't even get her employees into the state. When we get these the, these bills passed, and, and has there any language in there about our border? Like, you know, that that's the one question I have. Um, through business, through employment, and through trade, um, like we're saying, we can't get a clone from Canada, and they can't get a clone from us right now. You know what I mean? Um, whether it's hemp and legal in our in our state and country, and in hers, right? Um, is there any language or provisions? Is anybody talking about that? You know, that's my question. Because I mean, I know people that are, are trying to get to Canada. I know people that work in Canada. I know people that have uh, relationships and, and mutual other people up in Canada that they can't see right now. Um, what what does this do for, I mean, aside from COVID, um, is there any language in, in our, our next bit of laws to open up that border? And will it ever be open, do you think? Really, I, I genuinely don't want to beat a dead horse, but I've said it before and I'll say it again. This is, this is not even COVID related. The fact is that no, we're not really opening the borders. We're not even opening borders to genetics. And when we, when Anna Cluster traveled to Tennessee and we saw two different amazing farms and they were up to different things. We cannot even get the genetics into Canada versus Canadian genetics into the US, even though the soil amends for different things, right? So let's say that you, you're growing in, let's say Oklahoma for the sake of whatever. We, if you have better phosphorus, it doesn't matter. We can't get your genetics. We can't do that. So Corona or not, I, I call BS on the fact that we are having a really difficult time opening the entire cannabis trade as a whole. Mm. And I don't understand you know, that makes the difference between we, okay, so let's, we'll go back to the 1800s and we're doing Canadian fur trade. Great. How do we get that into the U.S. without having like, and I'm, I'm not condoning that, but I'm just saying how we started and what what we're up to now from a biology perspective and from just, you know what I mean? Like caring about the earth and saying, hey, okay, we're paying attention now. Mm-hmm. It boggles my mind that we're not able to share genetics. And the reality is what grows better in Tennessee will not grow the same in Ontario. No. It just simply won't. So let's be open to that and let's talk about it because it's not a drug and it should not be considered a narcotic and it should not be considered anything but a plan. Hmm. So we, we are definitely... Right there, the, the, 
the right. nurse ever get a narcotic issue is the biggest issue it faces. Once we can get these scheduled off that narcotics list, that I think, like you know, Tim says, that the 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 doors open, right, for essence, the the rivers can start flowing. But at the end of the day, even if we get legalization, state run in in in, in America, are our borders going to open? You know, that's that's can I. Can can you know I send you uh, one of my clones tomorrow? You know what I mean? Like, no. The border problem is way more complicated than simple open or close the border. Because mm. yes. we've got two countries. Thank you. you have the Canadian law, immigration, and you know, export, import, and you have American. So you've mm. got two separate countries' laws to kind of work out, at least for the US Canadian border. Now, most rational adult countries can have treaties and can agree to import export. Uh, and there's no reason they shouldn't. When you get into controlled substances, you have a whole entire nightmare of international treaties, of the UN's drug conventions, of these treaties that the United States for the last 50, 60 years has basically forced every other country to sign onto, um, all banned. The shipping, the use, the, you know, so you, you, this is like, it's not just a simple yes or no, one zero open close. It is a complex web of already existing treaties, contract, you know, agreements, tariff agreements, trade agreements that all have just integrated this anti-drug sentiment uh, forced by the United States over 50 or 60 years. And that doesn't change overnight. Um, you know, and until we see, and the, you know, when they say the state, you know, if the, what I do believe will happen, and that is the state's rights will be granted. Um, the US government will say states have the right to do this. That will not change the border situation because federally it will still be a controlled substance. Maybe mm -hmm. they decriminalize it, you know, maybe they, you know, delist it um, or put it into another category. It's still going to be governed by, you know, uh, customs regulations. Uh, it's still going to be heavily regulated. You're never going to cross the border like you would with a chocolate bar. Uh, and you can't even do that with a chocolate bar. It's an agricultural product. You got to declare it. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, that's always going to exist. Um, mm -hmm. Will there get to a point where the cannabis industry has been normalized to the point where there is a process and procedure and regulations to do it correctly and do it properly and do it well? Yeah, hopefully. Uh, but that's, you know, that's <laughs> five or six, seven steps down the road. We're not right. even close to that yet. We, we got to just get over arresting people in our own damn country for it before we can start, you know, talking about how best we're going to impose import export rules. So, you know, the border is a very complex area. We're just trying to get CBD products to South America right now or South Africa rather. And you should see what we're going through. Um, you know, and those are supposedly perfectly legal products here in the United States now. And it is still a nightmare. We're working with a South African law, a cannabis law firm, great people. Uh, but it's, 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 a, it's a project. Hmm. No, and it, that's the thing. It's when when we get these borders open, we talk about shipping and international shipping. We're starting to see countries being more and more open to export, right? Um, and you know, I, I was talking to people the other day that were saying to get stuff into America, they have to export it from Canada over to Europe back to America just to get around that border issue, right? Which is ridiculous when we think about it, right? Um, because it's legal state or country going to legal state, you know what I mean? Um, so, you know, as we say, I understand the two different countries aspects of it, but you know, you think from Canada, you know, the, the, why would they care? You know what I mean? That they're making money off it. It's a government controlled system here, right? They ship to Europe to know when it's coming here, but they did, you know, like you said, uh, like, I like how you put it, uh, reasonable adults, Tim, you know what I mean? <laughs> reasonable it's countries, you know what I mean? Even in Canada, you still have prohibitionists. You still have a, a minority, but a not small minority, a sizable contingent of people who are convinced marijuana is a drug. Uh, marijuana will kill you. Marijuana is dangerous. Uh, we need to control it. If, the, if we stop, if we deregulate, it's going chaos, chaos. Eight-year-olds running around joints. Roads turn to midnight. People are going to be dying. You know, <laughs> there are some people that believe this, you know, and that is why when you do something legislatively, you can't simply tell those people to fuck off and do what you want you need consensus, you need compromise. So that's why a lot of these things sound ridiculous. And you say, why don't we just do this? Yeah, let's do that. Um, but unfortunately, unless we're about to be willing to, you know, have an armed revolution, um, we have to work within a system. Uh, and that system mandates compromise. It sucks. I don't like it. It's the only way to get things done.
Yeah. Yep. Unfortunately, it's it's it. taking over the country. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> and then we're gonna say it again. Go vote, guys. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you can't say it enough. Uh, make sure your votes count. Um, and speaking of votes, um, I did see that they are trying to push off the new hemp. Um, updates and, and, and clearances off to 2022. They're trying to extend that. Uh, so hopefully we don't have to ex an extension on any of those updates uh, for hemp in, in America from the FDA. They need to get that stuff done. And, you know, again, um, we tend to do, do a lot of legal, we tend to let the law go, legalize it, then drag the fuck out of it until everybody can't afford to stay in the game anymore. And then you know, those, those solutions come through, like we see in mass, like we still have to see in mass people three years waiting for licenses, right? Um, paying for buildings, paying for power, paying for all these things. But anyways, rant over. Um, we're going to switch a, a little bit of gears right now, guys. Um, we have Thomas Mark Holm, um, Vermont Girl Coaching, who did a segment for us a couple of weeks ago that we didn't air because it was our segment where we couldn't get the show on. So it's kind of the right show for the right segment here. Um, we're going to air this. Uh, Thomas, you want to do a little introduction to it? I believe it's the freeze-dry cannabis episode, I hope, because that's the one I have up. Oh, okay. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, freeze-dry cannabis. So uh, a few weeks ago, we had um, CryoCure uh, on to do a uh, episode, and they uh, explained their a larger freeze drying machine. Well, they didn't call it a freeze drying machine. They, they said cryo cure machine. But uh, in my opinion, they are uh, fairly similar. They uh, run off the same uh, sort of system. You run off a, a cylindrical uh, tube that holds a, a large vacuum and then uh, freezes to uh, sub zero temperatures, usually around negative 20 to negative 40 degrees, at which point uh, it then begins to uh, vacuum and dry as the temperature rises. Uh, the moisture is actually pulled from the buds. So you're actually able to dry and cure your buds in less than 24 hours. Yeah, which is an amazing technology. Um, and I think uh, we talked about it a lot when they're on the show about people thinking it was a false, a hoax. And you know, we discussed the uh, the beauty of it being the entourage effect, the cannabinoid values. Hey guys, how you doing? Sorry about my dogs, guys. They're all excited. Um, <clears throat> So here's a little introduction video. Uh, I think a lot of people are still skeptical on the on the crowd carry. You know what I mean? It's really endorsed by Danny Danko, uh, Ed Rosenthal. You know, it was one of his kind of genius little baby projects that you know he just spoke of and someone took it ran with, right? Uh, we have Rick Naya on there. Uh, we're doing it, and literally, I'm not even lying. I'm technically rolling a blunt of it right now. That's why I want to get to video because we have a whole jar of the cryo cure right here. So. Um, <laughs> that being said, we're going to go to go to Thomas's video. We're going to get another blunt world here for the last little half of the show, and we'll finish up here. Um, thank you guys. Hold on, we'll be right back. And again, this is Vermont Girl Coaching with uh, Freeze Dry Cabus. Let's see if I can figure this out and do this right. Hold on. There's no audio on it, Joe. There's itch audio. audio. I hear audio, but I'll be back. Uh, I don't hear audio.
All right. I don't know what was going on with that audio right there. Uh, I think it was going. You guys hear me there? So I could uh, see the video running, but definitely could not hear any audio. All right. So I try to look at that real quick. I don't know where the audio is, but so what we'll do is uh, I'll repost that here later after the show so everybody can watch it if you guys want to check it out. I don't know what happened to the audio there. It might be an internal issue in my computer. Who knows? That's I right. It just gives somebody out, or it just gives everybody something to do with their time when they get off the show. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so, you guys, if you're interested in, in learning about the freeze dry campus, it's actually a, a wonderful video that Thomas put together. I don't know where the hell you were, or how you pulled that one off, Thomas, but you know he has his machines. Uh, he explains it very well. And if you guys do have a, a time to take and look at CryoCure um, and see what they're all about, it's actually a really great, interesting company. And you'll see like they, they, their machines are big. It's really unique what they're doing. Like we said, we had one on the show a few weeks ago. Um, so it's a it's a it's a, an experience of a smoke that I cannot explain to people enough. You know what I mean? And it's not what you ever expect. Uh, it's not a cure canvas by any means, uh, but that's the beauty of it. You know, if you're, if you're a connoisseur, you're really going to enjoy it. If you're a patient, that's where the beauty of it really lies for me. If you're a patient um, and you like the flower. So, all right, we're back. Sorry about that, guys. Again, I don't know about the audio. We'll figure that out. Again, we'll repost it. Uh, but we have a, a little bit of time left. Um, so, Tom, uh, tell us about your week in the fields. Uh, what's going on in the agricultural world and in our in our grow? We haven't discussed where we are literally in our growth cycles here in Vermont uh, because we're getting to that time where people are starting to see changes to their 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 flowers, right? Their 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 weed. Uh, absolutely. So right about now, um, depending on the type of uh, plants you're growing, you should be starting to see uh, the beginning stages of flowering. Some people are actually uh, pretty far into their flowering phases already, especially people that were growing autos. Um, now, some people don't really care for uh, growing autos too much in Vermont. They don't uh, consider the, uh, the climate to be acceptable for it. However, I've seen uh, plenty of uh, people throw out some, some decent hemp crops and actually be able to pull two harvests in a season uh, by growing uh, autos. So for people that are interested in that, if they're going to be growing from seed, it's definitely a viable option. I see a lot of those plants that are harvestable right now, um, whereas a lot of the, the feminized varieties and the regular uh, plants are just coming into flower depending on uh, their individual variety. And I expect to see them hopefully all finished by October 1st, because when it comes down to it, any of the plants that really push past October uh, in Vermont, you start to worry about uh, mold issues and, and bud rot. So. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully within the next uh, month or so, you should see a lot more uh, bud formation and a lot of beautiful smells as you're uh, driving through the Vermont mountains. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Well, it's, it's, it is that time, man. I've had a lot of people hit me up and be like, I'm starting to see my, my, my flowers. Is this right? I'm like, yeah, I mean, summer's almost there over. Is. Great indication of where we are in, in the year, right? Um, yeah, any, anytime once the, uh, the light starts uh, changing and starts uh, diminishing uh, throughout the rest of the year, uh, you know, as the, the light continues to increase uh, up until the middle of the summer, you have uh, your increased vegetative growth. And as soon as it starts to taper off, that's any time after that flowering can start to initiate. Mm. Right. No, it, it's wonderful. So um, now we talked about that. Uh, Danica, let's talk about you again. We, we started off with the show. We get we go right into the to hot topics. Um, one thing I really want to talk about was, you know, you're 40 for 40, right? Um, you're a woman in cannabis, right? How did you get started? Really, like, what? Where was that change for you? Was it something that was always in your life growing up? Or was it just an economical decision? Um, are you just a, a fellow stoner that needed a job? Like, how how do you get in this industry? You know what? That's such a cool question, and I love that so much because I was just discussing that the other day. I had a colleague that was in the industry, and at that time, I worked for a huge conglomerate in Canada where it was still taboo to even be associated with that. Mm. So I, I kind of veered away from it, and I had somebody that was like, hey, come GPR, do this, do this. I didn't do it, and then when I worked for the company, I realized that there were so few women in this company, and there are so few women farmers. Mm. It's kind of a cliche, but it's really a beautiful thing. And I've had so many women come forward since taking over the farm and just understanding, okay, cool, I can plant hemp and I, I have this space and this is what I'm going to do. 
so many women have come forward and said, hey, I've been a farmer for X, Y, Z. How do I get into that? So that's a really beautiful thing. And it, it's not an easy thing. Trust me, farming is not easy. But um, I really, I love the fact that people, whether it's women, boys, girls, whatever it is, are really getting into transitioning a typical cash crop into hemp farming. So mm. I've, I fell in love and I've said it before and I'll say it again. I totally fell in love. <laughs> now, how many, now, how many plants did you guys put down this season? This season, we do not know. I'll be totally honest because last before, like I mentioned, when we, when we bailed it, and we did 93,000 kilograms. We, we bailed it like typical hay because we wanted all parts. This season, I'm not really sure about the genetics. So I'm doing a new thing and it's called roguing. So I go through and I pull out all of the plants that are not pertinent to the females. So now we're doing a whole new step. And it's so cool because I, I call my farm like the guinea pig of what we're up to. And so that's when I go to clients and I know what their terrain is and I know what they're, what they're up to. I can say, you know what? It's probably not the best idea that you do that or this makes total sense. But we're going to row four acres by hand this year because we're badass. <laughs> so you did four acres by hand? It took the first season I rowed one acre and it took two days so this is probably going to take like a week but i'm on that team <laughs> now in the winter time what do you what does your farm transition to are you still doing stuff indoors is there is there allowability for that in canada for you and your mom um, your... well everybody so and every farmer that wants to transition to doing um a rotation crop is always asking the same thing, what's the best? So this year in Canada, oh, sure, um, so this year we did clan soy and soybeans, which is actually really, really good for the soil and it doesn't deplete it the way that corn does because corn sucks the nitrogen out. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I honestly am not sure what, what goes on in the US in terms of cash crop like that. So I did a split crop because everyone, like Corona, everyone was freaking out about um, what what the next step would be for, you know, their ROI on their crop, which makes sense, and I and I respect that. So then looking into it more and knowing that I wanted to do an R and D crop, it made total sense to do a split fan crop and split. Crop. Hold on one second. <laughs> Sorry. Molly, <laughs> did you hear that? Yeah, I think it's part of the whole new Zoom life that we all are experiencing. It's it's oh, it's it's a, it's a COVID issue, I guess, right? Um, at least we're all dressed for the show. That's all I gotta say. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> I got my pants on. Uh, it's <laughs> when we talk about these COVID meetings and these shows now that you know how we've all transitioned and uh, how those are just the funny issues with it. Dogs, animals, trains, people knocking. What's up, doggy? I mean, we've had customers come in the shows for us. So, you know, this is nothing new. We're used to this. Yeah, um, we said, especially in this day and age with animals and, and with COVID and where all of our meetings are uh, now, uh, I, I think it's just something that's a commonplace, right? Um, but you were saying as far as the, uh, um, you know, your farm is all done by hand, correct? This is the one thing I'm interested in because, you know, one acre by hand is a lot of work. This season is going to be done roguing. So roguing is removing the meal. But typically, mm. no, it would be done by combine. And that's what we did originally with the five acres. Mm. But um, that, that's kind of the interesting thing about my farm that each season we try something different and we evolve and we're like, okay, does this work better for our clients? Does this work less? What are we doing? Hmm. Now, how many people are on your team that you have there for Can Collective? Currently in Canada? Yes. One. One? <laughs> you, yeah. right? The other ones are stuck in America and they can't get over the border, right? Correct. 
<laughs> and we miss Ellen so much. She's amazing. Well, yeah, I mean, no, it's really, it's just me, and I'll do custom. Like, if I need to, like, source something else, then I'll do it. Mm. Yeah, no, it's just, it's me at the moment. Well, so that's a, it's an immense amount of work. Uh, what advice do you have to give to people who, who want to start a farm? I mean, we get asked all the time, like we talked about it earlier, like, you know, people want to get in the industry. What are your, uh, your, your pointers? Um, what are the things that people should look into? What are the, people, what are the things that uh, might be a couple of cons too to the industry that people just don't expect? You know what I mean? Obviously, it's work. You know what I mean? There's a lot of work for you on your level. Um, and it's not just about, you know, smoking blunts and, 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 and enjoying time, right? I mean, you're in the field, you're getting dirty. It really is. And that, that would be, that's the best piece of advice is know that it's not exactly that and you will get dirty and you will do that, but also be aware of the variables. And that is the biggest point that I can drive back home is whether and that was a hard pill for me to swallow because I was used to like corporate background and XYZ happened. We're farming now, baby. We do not have, we are not allowed to tell Mother Nature what to do. So it's really important to be able to be fluid and be flexible and know that it might suck for a moment, but this too shall pass. And I mean, if you if you commit, you commit, kind of thing. Don't don't do it half ass. I guess would be my best advice. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing, you know. It, 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 coming from such, I guess, a black illicit market for so long, I think a lot of people are, you know, they. And Tim will tell us. I mean, he deals with this all the time. You know, where people are, are fearing legalization because they've been so prohibited for so long. Um, some people don't care. They're just doing whatever they want to do in the, to, in, in the face of the law. And then, and then they're getting away with it. And we see people like, you know, we, we, we bring up this issue a lot of times, you know, selling seven eights and then looking at federal prison time. You know what I mean? It, it's so weird how every little issue, even in the same state, can be completely different outcomes and, and a completely different scenario for that, for that issue. Um, for you guys. Well, up here, point, so sorry to interrupt you, but that's exactly why I, I wanted common sense to weigh in on that because whether it's Canadian or US, I think it's really paramount to understand that there are regulations and there are unfortunately specific ways that we have to navigate around this and that's going to hinder us. So the more that you don't pay attention to that, whether it's weather variables, yes, that obviously sucks, but if you don't have your proper licensing in place, that is something that I would I would love Tom and Tim to weigh in on because Canadian or US, it's very, very important. Well, you brought up a great point earlier about shipping, right? And with uh, COAs and paperwork and all the little details, this isn't ag, right? You brought up a great point earlier. This isn't an agricultural market. I think that's where a lot of people that are stuck in ag that have never been in the cannabis business are, are hit the wall because they go, well, this used to be easy for me to ship corn. You know what I mean? Now I can't do exactly. this. I got to I gotta get this paperwork. I got to go hire Tim. I got to do what, what the hell's going on here? Um, <clears throat> and I'm sure Tim can, can, you know, speak from experience on that end well, where people, you know, they're, they're converting over to that. So, it, you know, it's it's inspiring to see somebody doing it. It's inspiring to see a woman doing it. It's inspiring to see somebody do it by themselves. And now that you've even gone to biofuel thoughts, that's another great step. Um, so congratulations to everything you're doing up there. Um, I want to say a huge shout out. Now, where can people find you? Like, how can people meet up with you? How can they find you? How can they check out your field? Instagram and Facebook, and I guess Danika then .com ish We're redoing our website. So I know, yeah, I know. I live in the ish at this moment. So I'm okay with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, but in Instagram and Facebook are typically our company platform at the moment. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so guys, reach out, say hi. Uh, again, uh, congratulations on the 40 for 40. And like you said, you're the only female cannabis company that was, was nominated, right, or voted in. Um, okay. It was a great article. Uh, so congratulations on that. Um, and I mean, keep doing what you're doing. It's interesting. And we'll have to have you come back on shortly. And then uh, hopefully the borders will open up here soon. So um, yeah, Ellen can get back up there. 
I gotta come see the farm. You know what I mean? Me and Thomas will ride up there, and uh, I can't wait. I ride. can't wait till the border opens. I've doing Canada, so I'm gonna just go spend a week up there, right? Um, but hopefully, this we can get to that point. Hopefully, we can get these 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 laws and bills and and things voted on, guys. Again, go vote. Go call your representatives. Go go make some noise. Um, the speaking wheel gets to Greece, and right now we're the ones that are just getting stone enjoying. The benefits of everybody else, but there's a lot of propositions out there. There's a lot of people that are, are big prohibitionists. There's a lot of people who do not want to see legalization. We talk about it consistently. There's still tons of arrests going on, guys. And as Tim, um, Danica, and Thomas, and we've all been saying all show is, is know your rights, know your laws, stay within your laws, don't operate outside of things because they are still arresting people. They are still going after people. We we're seeing issues from, you know, people going to jail for 30 years for ACE to, you know, People getting raided, legal businesses getting raided in Maine. Um, so, like you said, don't cut corners. Do the proper business. It's a, it's an industry now that has established rules, regulations, um, and they're going to they're get check on you. And then you're under the microscope. Like we say, Timothy says all the time, we're under a microscope. The laws are all different. It's not agriculture. Um, shipping, everything from shipping to handling to manufacturing, all has to be done differently, as you know as well, especially in Canada. I can imagine it's the same thing. You know what I mean? Um, and know what you're getting but don't be afraid to do it because it's it's a great industry, right? You, are you having fun doing, you know, do you do you like now what you're doing more than you were doing before? Because, you know, I know you you came from a totally different industry into cannabis, right? It's not like you were a farm girl that was like, I'm going to go do grow a hemp field. You, I mean, you, like you said, it was a completely different industry. So, and for you to do it 60, that should be a huge inspiration for lots of women um and even just anybody that wants to get into the industry and throw a play on the ground thomas as well will tell you all the time he's working with people he i think prefers the hand method uh more than the mechanical Absolutely. methods i know thomas has done a few fields that way especially here. <laughs> you, you'll find me even, even having had well, nurse knee surgery a couple of months ago you'll find me in the fields tail end of september on my knees fucking plants by hand i don't need a tracker i love everything about that well, again, we've talked about the benefits of that, Thomas, and we never really talked about any of the shows, but there's, there's, there's a lot of benefits to doing it by hand, like you, and, and, and you were saying, you know, specifically getting that roots into the ground, you know what I mean? Um, and making sure that that, that stock develops properly. Um, and, you know, and, and you brought up a lot of great points. Uh, you know, we're, we're very mechanically minded, and when you, when you can't get the plant down in the ground far enough, mechanically, you know, it's, it's you know, but again, I like Thomas's little trick. He, I know Thomas uses a fun one to drill holes in the ground. <laughs> 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 so we will put that out there anyways, guys. Uh, it's getting lit towards the end of this show. We're going to wrap this up shortly. Timothy Fair, I want to thank you again for coming on. Tim, is there anything you want to bring up uh, this week that you've seen in the news that I might have not brought up today? Covered Kamala Harris, covered federal, covered state. I think we covered more. We covered a lot. <laughs> we got a lot yeah, of I mean, we'll save some stuff for next week. Awesome. Again, Tim, it was so nice to meet you. Like, and congratulations, seriously. Well, Tim, we, we talked about your videos. You're, you're shooting a lot of content right now, um, which is great. So tell people where we can, they can find some of this content that you, you guys are doing right now and what you're up to. Oh, where? I'm just putting them on. <laughs> you know, Vermont Cannabis Solutions, obviously, LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, Facebook. Um, you know, we started Maine Cannabis Solutions. We're working on consulting uh, up in there, legal market with some people on applications. Um, we're going to be speaking at NECAN next month, uh, the NECAN virtual online. We're doing a, uh, Andrew and I are both going to be presenting there. Uh, I was nominated for an award for the County Community Awards. So we'll see how that works out. And yeah, no, we got a lot going on, but um, yeah, Vermont kind of Solutions is probably a good point. And I think we've got a lot point on the website there. We're mm -hmm. looking to hire an intern to take over our social media because we don't know what we're doing. you meet Tim, how can we, can we vote in Canada? How do we vote for you? <laughs> uh, yeah, go to NECAN, uh, NECAN.com and the Canada Community Awards and Vermont Activist of the Year or something like that. Yeah. Well, I'm writing you down in the end. I love right. it. I love it. Look at that. Is that even still going? <laughs> because the, the In the Weed show is nominated and we have heard. nominated. You're absolutely right. We've got a nomination for the show too. Oh yeah. my God. Justin, do you think that I already did not know that? You know I got you. <laughs> I, got well, I appreciate that for sure. No, I mean, 
A huge shout out to Nikan again. Uh, unfortunately, another you know effect of COVID there. You know what I mean? Where we you know no awards, everything's been postponed until next year. Uh, there's still a couple of events going on, guys, this summer, especially in the New England area, the Northeast area. If you guys want to check it out, uh, you can go to our In the Weeds group uh, page, and we try to throw as much events up there as we can. Um, I know um a couple have been canceled recently but there's a couple that are still going so can we bonfire still on, online um i know turf town has been canceled guys so if you guys are planning on doing that this year because it sounded like a great show great lineup they have now unfortunately canceled uh, and hopefully if we guys can stick to the covid whatever lockdown um things that were under wash your hands wear a mask and, and stay away from people um then hopefully we'll get through this and you know Still go have fun. There's still drive-ins. I've done the drive-in shows. I've done a couple of things outside. So there's a lot of fun things you guys can still do. Be safe, be responsible, and get outside, man. Get some sun, enjoy life, and hit a field. Get dirty, right? Uh, plants come every year. So fortunately, they weren't affected by COVID. Um, I know Thomas, Danica, and every farmer I know is busy this year. And they've all really invested heavily into everything. Um, so congratulations, guys. We're halfway through. Watch out for mold, watch out for issues, keep our fingers crossed for weather because the last two weeks doesn't look like we, we've anything promising for the end of summer. And uh, let's get together soon. Uh, let's get up to your farm. I want to check out what you have going on in um, this whole bioprocessing, biofuels, the whole the whole line. This is stuff that we're really interested in as a show. Um, and like I said, we talk about it a lot. We just never get it into the show because no one's really doing it yet. You know what I mean? Like you said, there's a lot of people... You know, they're all kind of touching on it. They're all kind of looking into this. Uh, but then again, like we asked, is it a sustainable option for fuel? You know what I mean? Let's let's be real about it. So I uh, keep doing what you're doing. Call me. Let's talk more about the biofuel stuff. We'll be back next week, guys. Same time, same place, 420. Come have a safety break with us. Get misted over the week. If you guys want to find out a little bit more about the mist, PM me. And if you guys want to find out more about Can Collective, Pam Danica. Again, thank everybody for coming, and we'll see you guys next week. Thank you. You guys did the best. All right, let's see if we can end this now. I got it. I got it. Oh. No. Okay.